Have you ever noticed the image on the back of US $2 bill? This is an image of the Declaration of Independence, adopted on July 4, 1776. Which explains why the 13 colonies at war with Great Britain considered themselves 13 independent nations, no longer under British rule. And with this declaration, these new states took the first collective step to form the United States of America. In fact, the original painting of this important day was drawn by John Trumbull in 1817. And this US $2 bill was designed in 1976. But what is important to us now is one of the audience in this room. Of course, he is not seen in John Trumbull's painting. But he can be seen on the $2 bill designed in 1976 and also on the old US $100 bill, designed in 1863. In fact, history has repeatedly witnessed the coming and going of great people who were beyond their time. Those who in some way had a great impact not only in the history of their country but also in the world. Da Vinci, Edison, Albert Einstein, Plato, Tesla are just examples of these people who came and went at some point in time. But among this, there is a person whom everyone remembers only his arrival. This person is one of the most key people in history because he was seen in the most sensitive moments, in different parts of the world throughout history. Although he has introduced himself with different names, he has introduced himself with one name for at least the last 300 years. He is none other than Comte de Saint-Germain, who has been seen many times throughout history and had a great impact on the course of world history, especially in the last three centuries. Let's go back to 1743, when a 45-year-old man enters the court of Louis XV. Countess Diad Hemer, who was the historian of the French court at that time, describes her presence at the French court as follows. It was the year 1743. It was rumored that a stranger, who was very rich by the splendor of his jewels, had just arrived at Versailles. Where has he come from? This is something that no one could understand. His strength and wisdom were evident from the first minute of talking to him. He had a soft and graceful body, delicate hands, small feet. His hair was black, his eyes were soft and penetrating. He was about 40 to 45 years old. In fact, all contemporaries of Saint Germain confirm the Countess' statement, and more importantly, all contemporaries described him as a 45-year-old person. Isabel Cooper Oakley, the theosophist and prominent British author, spent several years of her life studying about Saint Germain. Finally in 1911, she wrote a book called The Secret of Kings, which includes writings related to him and also the testimony of people who were somehow related to Saint Germain. And what is confusing is that everyone describes him as around 45 years old. In a part of the Book of Kings, she mentions the conversation of Countess George V with Saint Germain, who had met him 50 years earlier on a trip to Venice with her husband, and now, after 50 years, met him again in British Royal Palace. Will you have the kindness to tell me, said the Countess, whether your father was in Venice about the year 1710? No, madam, replied the Count quite unconcerned, it is very much longer since I lost my father, but I myself was living in Venice at the end of the last and the beginning of this century, I had the honor to pay you court then, and you were kind enough to admire a few barcaroles of my composing which we used to sing together. So according to this conversation, he was 45 years old in 1710. But how old was he really? 50? 100? 200? 20,000? According to his contemporaries, Saint Germain spoke many languages, including French, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Sanskrit, Greek.
Greek, Chinese, Arabic, and Persian, and spoke so fluently that he was considered a native. But where was he really from? France? Iran? Portugal? India? Atlantis? In fact, this was never revealed and remained a mystery. He became known as an all-rounder, playing not only the violin, but a variety of other instruments, including the harpsichord, reports the musical times. According to his contemporaries, he knew history so well that he seemed to have participated in the events he spoke about. Perhaps the strangest of them is talking about the wedding in Cana, the time of Christ's crucifixion and the First Council of Nicaea in 325. Madame de Pompadour, Louis XV's mistress, assistant and advisor, wrote that Saint Germain had traveled all over the world and that the king listened with enthusiasm to his stories about his travels to Asia, Africa, America and about the courts of Russia, Turkey and Austria. In fact, Louis XV valued Saint Germain's mastery in alchemy so much that after leaving Persian Empire in 1742, he took him directly to France. And in 1748 he built a laboratory and a set of rooms in the royal castle of Chateau de Chambord assigned to Saint Germain. He amused and astounded me. Why once he removed a large flaw from this very beautiful diamond and uh, tripled its worth. I set him up in a laboratory at the Trianon. He used to teach me chemistry. He even said I had a natural aptitude for... According to contemporaries, Saint Germain alchemy sessions were nothing but miracles. In fact, between 1737 and 1742, he did alchemy and scientific research on stones, especially diamonds, in the court of Nader Shah, Persian Empire. According to his contemporaries, he was able to turn the original metal into gold, and according to historical records, we know that Nader Shah stopped collecting taxes for three years, that is, until the last year of Saint Germain's presence at the Iranian court. Although this may be due to the property acquired from the Indian exchequer, in fact, this period was exactly when Nader Shah was supposed to attack the Ottoman Empire, but he suddenly decided to attack the Mongol Empire, which resulted in the attack on northern India and then Delhi and the conquest of India, and he returned home with a mysterious diamond called Koh Noor, a diamond that has not yet been created like it in the world, and no source of its production is known. And after that, King Nader sent his troops to the Ottoman Empire. But in addition to his service in the courts of Persia and France, we see him in the courts of Great Britain, Germany, Austria, and even organizing a coup in Russia. In her memoirs, the Countess Diethemer mentioned that Saint Germain warned Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette about the impending French Revolution. According to his contemporaries, he was skilled in healing and using medicinal plants. Some of his contemporaries who closely followed his life believed that the medicines he invented, along with his habit of eating simple foods, strengthened the Count's health and prolonged his life. In fact, this is a very important point about him because all those who have been in contact with him agree. One very mysterious thing. In all of the banquets we have attended together, I have never seen him eat one morsel of food. That they have never seen him eat anything other than vegetables and grains. He went to Germany in the 1780s and lived in the court of Prince Charles and worked in alchemy and producing a special type of fabric. But his life seems to end here, for according to Prince Charles he died at his residence on February 27. 1784. Unfortunately, he died here in this castle. But did Prince Charles himself see his death and burial? No. Now until you come to mention it, I didn't. I was away at the time. No, he did not see it, because he was staying in castle at that time. And nine years later, in 1793, exactly at the time of the death of Louis XVI, 
Saint Germain was again seen at the head of the French Revolution. A revolution that he had warned Louis XVI and Marie Antoine many years ago. He was also seen many times in the 19th century, perhaps the most important of which is his meeting with Annie Besant in 1896. Annie was a women's rights activist and a British philanthropist who, with the guidance of Saint Germain, was able to bring employment, better living conditions, and proper education to the poor at the end of the 19th century. In the 1930s, Saint Germain met Guy Ballard and his wife, Edna, and they founded an organization called I Am for Spiritual Education in Chicago. In fact, the term I am refers to the ancient Sanskrit mantra, Soham, which means I am that I am. Of course, don't forget that when Moses asked God on the mountain, who are you? He replied, I am who I am. Here Saint Germain taught many teachings through the I Am organization. Perhaps one of the most important and well-known of them being the Order of the Violet Flame. His purpose of these teachings is to help people to enter the new age, which is Aquarius. You have no doubt realized that the world is about to enter the age of Aquarius. Astronomers believe that the astronomical age is a product of the gradual rotation of the Earth. Or to be more precise, it is the movement of the equinoxes at a speed of 50 seconds of arcade per year. And this means that it takes 72 years for the equinoxials to move one degree against the fixed stars. In this way, one complete cycle of the zodiac takes 25,920 years. So, it takes 2,160 years for the vernal equinox to move from one zodiac constellation to the next. And since we are now in the constellation of Pisces, we enter Aquarius. Here, I am organization, as well as the Neo-Sufi society, believe that there are seven rays, or seven metaphysical principles that govern both individual souls, and the unfolding of each 2160-year astronomical age. And the next astrological age, the age of Aquarius, will be ruled by the seventh ray, Violet, and Saint Germain is called the cosmic master of the age of Aquarius because of the teachings he gave decades ago to prepare for this change. In fact, the Theosophical Society with Helena Blavatsky is known. Helena Blavatsky is someone who went to a temple in India in search of wisdom. There she met a group of spiritual adepts, or as she called them, masters of ancient wisdom, who sent her to Tibet, where they taught her to gain a deeper understanding of the combination of religion, philosophy, and basic science. Did you get that? This part of her life is exactly similar to the part of Steve Jobs' life. In the video, The Secret of Steve Jobs' Success, we saw that Steve dropped out of college, then went to a temple in India to meet a yogi, from there he went to the Himalayas to follow Mahavatar Babaji, who is said to be nearly 2,000 years old. And when he came back, he founded the Macintosh company that is today's Apple. But after meeting Saint Germain, Helena Blavatsky writes about him in the Theosophical Dictionary. Kant Saint Germain was certainly the greatest Orientalist Europe has seen in the past centuries. Yes, you heard right, Saint Germain was also seen at the end of the 20th century, that is, when he suddenly went to the foundation of the Theosophical Society to help Master Muria, Master Katomi, and Helena Blavatsky. But no doubt, what makes him mysterious is that his name appears among the founders of Freemasonry in 1717. Even in 1785, he was chosen as a representative of Freemasons for a convention. And what makes him even more mysterious is that we see his name as the leader of a worldwide fraternal organization called the Rosicrucian, which claims to possess the esoteric wisdom and secrets of existence that have been taught to them since ancient times. 
Well, in fact, maybe you will understand the importance of this when we spelling the name of this organization. Rosicrucian is a Greek word that is composed of two parts, rosy and crucian, which means rose cross. And if you have watched our previous video called, Decoding the Greatest Secret in History, we said that the Rose Cross is a sign of early Christians who have the true teachings of Jesus Christ, or in other words, the Holy Grail. Let's go back again. In the year 1600, the Rosicrucian Society installed a mysterious column with a height of 365 centimeters, on top of which there is a cross, in the backyard of a church in Hende in the south of France. For centuries this cross was only revered as a sacred symbol until in the 1920s an unknown person named Fulcanelli wrote a mysterious book. In a part of this book, he mysteriously refers to the end of this age by referring to this cross. And he writes in another part like this. Whatever its age, the Hende cross shows by the decoration of its pedestal that it is the strangest monument of primitive millinerism, the rarest symbolical translation of Kiliasm, which I have ever met. This column has four sides at the pedestal. An eight-pointed star is carved on the eastern side. The side of a fabled moon is on the north side. On the western side is a raging sun, whose rays are alternate different, and there are also four six-pointed stars on the same side. And a strange oval shape installed on the south side with a cross in the middle and four alpha letters on each side of the cross. Actually, these letters are like a kind of puzzle that you have to fill, and of course these letters are written in such a way that they are also symbols of Freemasonry. In the western part of the cross, there is an inscription in Greek, which translates into English as, Hail, O Cross, the only hope. But in the eastern part of the cross, there are the letters I, N, R, I, which appear to be the famous letters that were written on the cross when Christ was crucified. That is, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. But if you read these letters according to the instructions in the book and the inscriptions in Latin, it means Igni Natura Renovator Integra, which means, with fire, nature is completely renewed. At the same time, around 1600 AD, cards called tarot appeared. These cards seemed quite fun until after two centuries, in the late 1700s, John Baptiste Alliette published the original guide to using those cards. Now let's take a look at these cards. If you look at the number 17 of the tarot card, you will find the same feathered star under which a woman is pouring water. Card number 18, just like the pillar, is the side of a mythical moon. Card number 19 is the face of a sun, which is exactly like the column of its rays, one of which is different. And instead of four six-pointed stars, there are four sunflowers. And card number 20 is called the Judgment, which if you look closely, you can see that a cross is attached to the angel's trumpet. In a video called, The Sons of Mithras, we saw that the Vatican banned one of John's writings, called, Apocryphon of John, which were the words of Christ himself to him, and accepted the other one as part of the Bible, of which Revelation is a part. So now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 20. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon and chained it. And further, he says that fire will rain from the sky and will burn the army of evil. And in the next chapter, we read, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away.
And the last tarot card, the card number 21, is called the world. In this card you see the same strange rhombus. And three animals, and one human, which are the same as the four alphas on the pillar. And in the middle of the rhombus, a cloth is wrapped around the angel, which is exactly like the kundalini snake. If we take these beings on the zodiac, we will see that they are exactly the same as the constellations. Taurus, Leo, Aquarius, and Aquila. Note that from 1930 onwards, the International Astronomical Union replaced Scorpio with Aquila, but if you look closely at the constellation, you will see that the Aquila is right next to Scorpio. Finally, they say that we are about to enter a new age, which is called the Age of Aquarius. But this shift has coincided with the end of the 25,920 year cycle. This cloth starts from the cow and goes to Aquarius, and we saw in the video, the earth is changing. That half of the cycle was exactly the last ice age and when Mithras came to earth and sacrificed the cow, which is a symbol for the zodiac. With fire, nature is completely renewed. Fire is a symbol for the bridge between mortals and gods. This bridge is vibration and frequency that is changing. That is, this age is done by changing the vibration and frequency of the earth, as a result of which the people who cannot resonate with that frequency cannot associate with the gods, that is, the positive people who can resonate with that frequency. The dragon is a symbol for power seekers and bullies, or in other words, those who seek the material world. And finally, the fire that reigns is the photon belt. This strange rhombus is the same photon belt that marks the end of the 25,920 year cycle, and the middle of it, which is 12,960 years, with two signs like a cross. This age ends with intense light, and the new age begins with the same light. These are the teachings of Christ that were banned. Pay attention to this painting of Christ, which is in an old Bible in the library of the University of Karlsruhe in Germany. This painting was painted in 1200 AD. He clearly indicates with his fingers the time of this great event. In the late 18th century, Saint Germain wrote a classic occult work called, The Most Holy Triad of Wisdom, in which he used a combination of contemporary languages with ancient hieroglyphs and a number of poems, with deep philosophical content. The book is divided into 12 sections representing the 12 signs of the zodiac. The hidden content of this book is said to refer to an allegorical initiation that explains many Kabbalistic, alchemical, and Masonic mysteries. On our website, there is a meditation called Violet Tune that will help you to make better progress on your spiritual path.